Church, I would like to invite you to turn in your Bibles today to Matthew chapter 28. We'll be reading verses 16 through 20 if you'd like to follow along in your own Bible or device. But once again, our focus passage is Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them, I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. It is my belief that two seasons will come to an end tonight. The first of which is this season of Halloween that seems to get more eventful and more eventful and more eventful every year. There was always an opportunity to dress up, to get candy, to go to a church trunk or treat, and I'm not complaining. It's been a very fun month, especially to do that again after last year when we didn't have so much of that going on. But hey, after tonight... We won't be doing that again for a while. I also believe that Major League Baseball's season will come to an end tonight. (laughs) Now, I don't believe in superstition or jinxing. I don't believe I have that kind of power, so don't get nervous about what I just said. I just got a good feeling. Just got a good feeling that Major League Baseball will come to an end tonight as the Atlanta Braves win their next World Series. So you're going to have some free time on your hands these next couple of weeks, aren't you? I'm, I'm fully aware that we're not too far from Thanksgiving and then things start back again when we get to Advent and, and the Christmas season. I realize that it may not calm down for long. But in the meantime, in these next couple or three weeks, why don't you use some of your spare time to explore some of the great mysteries of the Bible? For instance, where is the Ark of the Covenant? I can promise you it's not being handled by top men in some warehouse, as suggested by Indiana Jones. Help us figure out what year Jesus was born. I know, zero A.D., right? No, probably not, give or take a few years. If you can figure that one out, be sure to let me know. See if you can find out who wrote the book of Hebrews. Oh, it was Paul, right? No, the book doesn't say that. It sounds like Paul in some areas. In other areas, it doesn't sound so much like Paul. Maybe it's Paul's associate. Maybe it's someone else. But don't focus too much on these questions of fairly little significance regarding our Christian life. What does Romans 13 say about submission to government? Is that for all peoples at all times? Is that for us today and four years from now and then four years down the road? Does it apply equally at each of those points? What about Matthew 15 where Jesus says, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. What does that mean? What about where the writer of Ecclesiastes says that everything is vanity and yet we're called to live a purposeful life? How do, how do we hold those things in tension? If you'd like to discuss those issues, feel free to stop by the office of my fellow staff and I'm sure that they would love to discuss those things with you. But there's one we're going to look at just briefly today. And it's the scripture that we've just heard, the Great Commission. You may never have thought of the Great Commission as a mysterious scripture, but there are some questions here. Like, for instance, what was the mountain that the disciples met Jesus on? It doesn't tell us, at least in this text. Do the nations, uh, by way of the Greek word ethne, refer to the Gentiles as a whole? Or, or does it involve all ethnicities? What is the text trying to say? 
And that doesn't even include questions about baptism that different churches would have something different to say. No, it's about the word go. Can you settle a score for me about the word go? If you did a quick Google search and asked, go Great Commission participle, You'd have people going at it about, is this word go about a command or an imperative to go? Or is it more accurately translated, as you are going, make disciples? There's a little difference there. Go and make disciples, or as you are going, make disciples. It may seem like splitting hair, but some take great value in how we interpret and translate that phrase. For instance, if it says, go and make disciples, it, 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 it might, we might mistake it for something like limiting it to a mission trip, like one week, just go and make disciples, just for a limited time. But then if we translated it as you are going, make disciples, it, it makes it a little less urgent, it seems. It, it seems to lessen the significance of being sent. And this might seem like a silly, silly conversation to have, but no matter how you translate it, whether we go or whether we are going, we are indeed a sent people. The larger challenge today is to remember and take seriously our being sent from this place, seeing it as critical as any other moment that we have experienced in this service today. For a very intense spring and summer of 2021, we were challenged to remember that the church is not a building, but a sent people. And as we regathered last year and then stayed home towards the end of the year, and then regathered for worship, and then some of us stayed home again, and now as we're regathering again, and hopefully for the last time, this is how all of this goes, we're reminded of the importance of gathering together for a worship hour. And yet I do have concerns that as we gather in this space, rather rather physically or by way of radio or internet, I fear that we will shrink back into the mindset, if unintentionally, that Christ only exists in this space. Today's scripture reminds us that nothing could be further from the truth. The Gospel of Matthew shows us the disciples' first encounter with the resurrected Christ on a mountain where they worshipped. Their first encounter with Jesus since the days of the passion in the crucifixion. They worshipped Christ on that spot, but Matthew also says that they doubted. Now, why would Matthew include something like that? Well, maybe the Gospels are just very straightforward and honest. Perhaps the disciples believed that what they were seeing and what they were experiencing in that moment as they experienced the resurrected Christ was just too good to be true, given the events of the previous few days. It might be appropriate for the disciples after all that heartache and and fear during the crucifixion to wonder if their experience with the Christ was just too good to be true. When we wonder if this gospel is too good to be true, and we have those moments of doubts as the disciples do, Jesus doesn't say, hey, wait a minute, we're not going any further until you erase all that doubt and uncertainty. No, Jesus invites us to be commissioned alongside those first disciples, doubts and uncertainties at all, because we don't go on our own authority. Jesus says, I've received all authority in heaven and on earth, so now go, or as you are going, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Go and make disciples. Did you catch that part? We like to skip over the disciple part and go straight to the baptizing part, right? 
We sometimes view the Great Commission exclusively in terms of seeking converts. It's why Dallas Willard called it the Great Omission of the Great Commission. As Christians, we rightfully take evangelism seriously, but we cannot pass over this command of Christ to make disciples. That's more than a convert. A disciple follows in Christ's footsteps. A disciple imitates Jesus at every point of life. A disciple is fully obedient, and so it is with Christ. Jesus says, I will be with you every day until the end. I think sometimes we see this as a nice add-on, a nice way to tie up the gospel message. But it's so important. It's the affirmation that we will be in relationship with Christ even as we go from this place. What we call the benediction or the sending at the end of our service is usually less than one minute. It's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 seconds to 30 seconds to maybe a minute if we're singing a chorus as we will do today. But don't let the brevity of that moment of our sending diminish the importance of that moment in our service. Think about the last time you parted ways with family or friends after a gathering or after a holiday. Maybe it's been a while since you've done that. But remember the last time that that happened, and, and through all of that stay and all of that party or gathering, there was only a very small portion of time dedicated to the farewell, right? You may have enjoyed days together, but there in those last few minutes, you, you, you gave hugs, you told them you loved them, you look forward to seeing them again, how you'll stay in touch while you're apart, and talking about the next time you will meet together. It's only the last few minutes of your time together that you say goodbye, but it is not unimportant. It solidifies your relationships as you part ways physically. In the final few moments of this service, we are solidifying our relationship with Christ as we prepare to go from this place in the benediction, we recount Jesus' final moment in that Gospel of Matthew, where the disciples are charged to go out and to invite others into a discipling relationship with Jesus, to baptize, to teach obedience to Christ. And so we do the same here. With such ascending, we're, we're not just ending a scheduled event or activity or program. We're transitioning to our being the missionary church that God has called us to be here in Gainesville, Georgia. And if we truly believe all that we have said or sung or prayed or recited in this space, then we must acknowledge that the work of the Spirit does not and cannot end here. Christ will continue to teach us and transform us and transform the world around us even when this hour comes to a close. As you consider and anticipate the next few minutes and as we prepare to go from this place, I want you to keep in mind something by, uh, said by Daryl Guder, a missiologist, who said the church is the people of God who are called and sent to represent the reign of God. We're called not just to represent Christ in the world, we are called to represent Christ in the world. We are called to represent what we have heard, what we have shared, and what we have sung in this space. The hour we just experienced is preparing us to present the gospel to all whom we encounter. We've modeled reverence in this hour, and so we present full reverence to Christ even as we leave this space. We've spoken truth, and so we are sent to represent the truth of Christ in our own words and actions as we go. We've sung about the authority of Jesus in our lives, and so we are sent to represent Christ-like authority and obedience. Most importantly, we've spoken of the love of Christ, and so we are sent to represent 
present the love of Christ that we have shown in this space to our neighbors as we go. The challenge of being a missional church and a missional people is similar to the challenge of how we regard worship. If you regard this hour as merely routine or obligation, then most likely your missionary lifestyle will be regarded as the same. But if you believe that when we enter this space, we enter a space where we listen and encounter the crucified and resurrected Jesus and receive God's word from the Spirit, in the same way our lifestyle will be fruitful. Our life is a never-ceasing acknowledgement of God's wonder and splendor and work in the world. And so are we ready to call attention to it as we go? Can we work together to frame worship as mission and mission as worship at First Baptist Church? As we prepare to go, consider the question, where are you going? With whom will you share? You've likely heard that difference about uh, between doing church and being church. For a long time, I didn't put a lot of stock in that phrase. I thought it was splitting hairs, kind of a, an obnoxious sense of semantics, turning a phrase that didn't carry much weight. Who cares if we're doing church or being church? I told myself for so long. But I like to believe that we take what we do in this space quite seriously and joyfully and meaningfully. And what we do in this space doesn't matter much if we will not be what we have claimed in this space. Being is about our soul, our entire person that goes beyond any calendar or church event. And as much as we can display a missional spirit with events, we must make it clear that our very being has been transformed by Christ in this space. And those things cannot be separated. Church, I am thankful that together we have encountered Christ in this place. But now we are being sent by the Spirit to share the good news of Jesus as we go beyond these walls. Whether we go or whether we are going, may we always be attuned to the movement of the Spirit at First Baptist Church, knowing that Christ is with us all of our days as we seek to go from this place and share the good gospel that we have heard today. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for the opportunity to gaze upon your encounter with the disciples when they first saw you after your resurrection. And we join with them in worshiping you and placing in your hands what we will be doing as we leave this space. Help us to be mindful of the fact that our worship does not cease at 12 o'clock. Help us to be mindful of the fact that our worshiping lifestyle has just begun, that we have heard the truth of the word of God in this space, and we intend to share it with our words and our deeds. May we be attuned to your spirit as we prepare to dismiss. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.